All right, good morning. My name is Hugh Sung. I am the assistant of the oral history program here at the Battleship New Jersey, which is docked here in Camden, New Jersey. And today is Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018. We are on board the Battleship New Jersey. And our interview guest is uh, Michael Shepard uh, from Cranberry Township, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Shepard uh, served in the United States Navy uh, from 1978 to 1994. Did I get those correct, Mr. Right. Shepard? Okay. And he served on numerous ships, including uh, the battleship New Jersey, which is where we are doing our recording. So, without further ado, uh, welcome back, Mr. Shepard. Thank you. Yeah. And this is your first time back on the ship, right? In 35 years, yes. Okay. Feel good. Feels good to be back? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So, let's begin our conversation by asking your current age. 67. Okay. And uh, how old were you when you joined the U.S. Navy? 27. Okay. And uh, how was uh, joining the Navy? Like, do uh, you remember anything from seeing the recruiter to enlisting? Uh, basically, uh, I was walking by a Navy recruiting station in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and it just came to me that. Uh, and if I joined the Navy, became a naval officer, I could, you know, uh, teach uh, or, or go to the places that I used to teach world history about, because I had been a, a teacher up until then. And uh, I filled out the paperwork for an age waiver, got the age waiver, and, and left right after Memorial Day of 1978 to go to OCS. Okay. So you already had your degree, and you went to OCS for commissioning, correct? Correct. All right, yes, sir. So, uh, where was OCS at this Newport, time? Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. And uh, anything you remember from there? How was that like? It was a hoot. Uh, it was four months of uh, uh, a lot of, they were essentially trying to find out how you re re responded to long term diffuse stress. And so you would you know, be uh, uh, treated like a, a, a fresh recruit for the first you know, week or two, and then it was march to class, go to class, learn uh, leadership and management, learn the rudiments of firefighting, learn the basics of uh, uh, celestial navigation, <laughs> and uh, you know, and then PT every day. Uh, one fun thing was they uh, every week, uh, sometimes every day, we would. Uh, get in these small uh, boats uh, and uh, and actually maneuver around Narragansett Bay. And there would be like four of them and we would uh, pra practice uh, 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 formation uh, sailing and you know with uh, search turns and a whole bunch of other neat stuff. I enjoyed the heck out of that. And Again, that was from April, uh, May of 78 to uh, middle of uh, September um, uh, of 78 when I got my commission. Okay. Uh, you still had to do things like gas chambers, swimming, and marksmanship? Uh, we, yeah, as a matter of okay. fact, everything. Uh, we, we did damage control type stuff in a, in a trainer that had probably the coldest water I've ever felt. Uh, we did uh, 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 marksmanship uh, training. Uh, if you got a high enough score, you'd, you'd actually get a ribbon, you know, you know for sharpshooter or something like that. But I didn't. <laughs> right. you, train, you train with both rifle and pistol? No, it's just pistol. Just then. pistol. Okay. I think it was the, the reason why was. Uh, if you were standing like a quarter deck watch or something, the only thing you'd have with you is a sidearm. Okay. And were they 45s? Yeah. Okay. And so they had a recoil that made you uh, jump up and to the left every time you shot it. All right. And uh, you said you had to swim, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you swum, uh, uh, and uh, then you had to. Uh, you know, tread water for so many minutes. You also had to tie your uh, sleeves and your uh, pants off and uh, basically fill them with air 
so that you could uh, uh, stay afloat even longer, you know. Okay. Yeah, I heard they all go through that, even enlisted. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, after OCS, so what was your next step? Uh, the first thing they did is they sent me to my, uh, my first ship for four months. And uh, my uh, eventually I was supposed to become the communications officer. But that would be after I went to uh, the basic surface warfare officer school again in, in Newport. But uh, for four months they have had us go to our ships and essentially get our feet wet. And uh, when I first got there, I was following the co communications officer around. And then they needed somebody to, to help out in uh, the deck department. So they made me the second division officer. So I was responsible for all the bosun's mates and the maintenance of uh, uh, the hull and line and things like that uh, that were in the after part of the ship. First division ran the, uh, the forward part of the ship. And uh, I had a second class uh, bosun's mate as my uh, leading petty officer and had a, actually had a, I learned a lot and had a real good time uh, while I was uh, there. Uh, even qualified for officer of the deck in port and got you know, several other thing qualifications uh, uh, out of the way before I went back to surface warfare school in uh, February, I think it was, of uh, 79. And that lasted, I think, three or four months, then comm school for two months, and then finally back to my original ship, the USS Concord, AFS-5. Okay. For the historical record, uh, what was the Concord uh, the ship type? It was a combat store ship, uh, AFS-5. Okay. And so what it, what it, it also served as the uh, Sixth Fleet Logistics Coordinator, and they had a big UNIVAC computer on it, that handled all the requests for uh, food and spare parts for the entire Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. And it was up to our ship to, uh, you know, to uh, consolidate all those requests, farm them out to other auxiliary ships, and then set up uh, underway replenishment rendezvous so that all these food uh, pieces of uh, uh, food and spare parts could be distributed to the various ships of the fleet. And uh, there was one time when uh, we, our operations boss, uh, had to be you know, sent off the ship because he was having a medical problem. And for a month, you know, I was, uh, this is later on when I was the navigator, I and the supply officer and uh, the um, deck department head, we figured out what the uh, replenishment cycle would look like and did all the messages and everything like that to get it done and uh, didn't miss anything. We, we did it. But uh, then we finally got an ops boss back and I could go back just navigating. Okay. So you were navigating the Concord, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. There's, it, I, once I got out of communications officer school. I was communications officer for maybe six months and we won the uh, the Green Sea for you know, uh, communications excellence. Then the, uh, the CO, or the, actually the XO, needed uh, someone to help him square away his ship's office because he was having some some problems with them. So he sent me down to be the officer in charge of the ship's admin office. And for about four or five months, I did that, squared it away. Uh, I was also the uh, education uh, uh, officer too, and set up uh, a system that facilitated making sure that people that were coming to us had all the, the their tickets punched. Uh, we also went through a command inspection. And when it came to the command inspection, I had so many little jobs other than, you know, being the admin officer that out of 14 different categories, 
I was solely responsible for 11 of them. And we essentially passed with flying colors in all those categories. Uh, after, you know, admin, uh, they made me the combat information center officer. And so all the uh, operations specialists that ran all the radar scopes and, and stuff, uh, they worked for me and uh, also communicated with other ships. And then finally, they, uh, they need, we were getting a, uh, a new navigator and we went out you know, for sea trials of some sort and they asked that uh, officer to take the ship alongside our pier. Well, in doing so, he screwed up something and took out about 12 pilings of one of the piers in Norfolk, Virginia. And the skipper said, nah, he's not going to be my navigator. So they turned to me, sent me to two refresher courses, and uh, about three weeks later, we got underway uh, for a med deployment. And until that night, uh, that happened, I had never held a sextant in my hand and you know, essentially taught myself how to use one and learned how to do uh, sun shots, sun lines, star shots, and all those other things. So I could uh, give the captain an eight o'clock report that was based on celestial navigation, Loran, and they had put a satellite navigation system on board to test it out. And so he had all these things and he knew where he was in the middle of, of the uh, ocean. It was fun. That was probably my most fun as a naval officer, right. was being a navigator. So this was all at the Concord? Yeah. All right. Uh, now, just to be clear, it's a logistical ship, correct? Yeah. So was it armed in any way? It had a, a three inch 50 mount on the forward uh, end of it. Okay. Yeah, after I left it, years after I left it, it uh, became part of the military sea lift command. They, you know, decommissioned it out of the Navy and then essentially made it a civilian ship that handled Navy stuff. Okay. So after this, uh, it was the New Jersey, correct? Yeah. Uh, after I had qualified, you know, for uh, surface warfare officer and got my pen, uh, you know, one of the things that you need to do is, you know, get your qualifications as, a, as an engineer. So I submitted a, a request to, to split tour, you know, to somewhere there where I could get my engineering call. And the uh, uh, personnel command, you know, uh, took a look at what I had been doing, and they said, "Okay, we've got an opening for main engines officer on the battleship New Jersey. You want to go?" I said, "You betcha." It, and one of the reasons why is when I went to the uh, Concord first, next, right next to it, off the port side, uh, was the the uh, the New Jersey, I believe it was. No, no, Wisconsin and uh, Iowa. This was in Philadelphia, right? In Philadelphia. Yes, it was. And the aircraft, the old Air Essex aircraft carrier Shangri La, and. I remember talking to two other officers, one of them was the communications officer, and I had just read an article where somebody had this idea of uh, let's take some of the guns off in New Jersey, put some tomahawks and some uh, uh, sea sparrows on there, and you know, kind of modernize it uh, a bit and bring it back in commission. And uh, they, the two other officers laughed at me. And I said, you mark my word. And so it's barely two two years later, and I'm going to that ship. <laughs> so it was really kind of, you know, uh, ironic. Oh, yeah. It basically drew it out for them almost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, where were you when you first saw New Jersey, and do you remember what date it was? It was sometime in, in February. Uh, Wife and I had uh, we we got there, stayed with a cousin in Huntington Beach or in Santa Ana, okay. and uh, we found uh, an apartment in in Huntington Beach, and uh, I think the the first time we really actually saw it was the day I reported. Okay. You know? yeah. All right. Was this before the recommissioning? Yeah, I was part of the recommissioning uh, crew. Okay. Yeah. 
And there were several others that had been there for over a year because it took quite a long time to refit that thing. Okay. And uh, and we we stayed uh, if we had to stay uh, like for watch or whatever. The uh, we slept in these uh, personnel barges, you know, that, that were moored nearby. And uh, but because you couldn't stay, stay on the ship, it was just too filthy, you know. <laughs> uh, so, um, what was your first reaction when you first saw the battleships, whether it be the Iowa, the Wisconsin, or the New Jersey? Well, what well, uh, I I knew of them, but I never seen one up close, okay. and so you're you're kind of awestruck the first time you see it, but also. Uh, because it was um, next to a pier, the uh, it did it kind of surprised me that the the main deck seemed to be so low, and uh, it wasn't until we were anchored somewhere and I had to take a motor whaleboat, you know, from the shore back to it, that you really got a sense of how massive that thing was, you know, the the battleship was, and uh, the. the you know the size of, of everything just you know really <laughs> took your breath away. Oh yeah. Uh, so you were there during the recommissioning ceremony, correct? Yeah. All right. Anything you remember from that day? I remember how the how pink uh, President Reagan's cheeks were. It almost looked like he uh, had rouge, but those you know it, that was natural apparently uh, for him. Um, I wish I could remember the the Secretary of the Navy, but he was a young guy uh, who also uh, spoke at it. And uh, you know, ironically, years later, uh, the MPA, the main propulsion assistant on the uh, New Jersey that I worked for, uh, he became the chief engineer on the the, the uh, Missouri, and. Uh, so I, he invited me to the Missouri recommissioning. So I actually attended two battleship recommissionings, the Missouris and the uh, the Big J. Okay. Yeah, not to jump too far ahead, but uh, anything you remember from the commissioning in Missouri as well? Oh, uh, when, uh, the ship uh, comes alive uh, thing. There's a, a, a step in the ceremony where uh, the order is given to uh, man the ship. And uh, several hundred uh, sailors uh, in their uh, Cracker Jack whites, I think it was, uh, no, they were blues, uh, just come out of nowhere and run on board the ship through the various gangplanks that they had, uh, had set up. And then they man the rail all around the, the, the ship, and it's really impressive. And I, I think at the same time, they're, they're play, uh, they played uh, Anchors Away on the uh, uh, amplifier you know, and, and stuff. It was, it was really something else. Another thing I just remembered about that ceremony on the New Jersey was my, uh, I got to take not only uh, my my wife, but a friend of hers, and my mother, and her brother, my uncle. Uh, in World War II, that same uncle had been in uh, supply, or in, in you know, basically he was a civilian, but he handled you know, supply functions, and would uh, order spare parts and, and things of that sort. So he was really tickled to. Uh, have been able to uh, to attend that ceremony, and, and you know, it, it was, there were other things that went on too. Uh, even prior to the to the ceremony, there was a a, a banquet held on the uh, uh, the Queen Mary, and uh, uh, let's see, my mom actually ran into a. Uh, a guy who was a, uh, on, on her favorite soap opera, you know, who was a star, who was invited to that too. And apparently, he was uh, uh, in the Naval Reserve, and uh, he, he had also played on 
Mikhail's Navy. He was uh, uh, the ensign, you know, the, you know it was uh, Captain Binghamton's uh, assistant. But anyway, uh, all those things, you know, just you know, in one week, it was re really, you know, quite the ceremony. Okay. Quite the experience. Yeah. Did you get to see Nancy Reagan? She wasn't there, oh, not she wasn't. that I recall. Uh, just T. In fact, he flew in on uh, the, his helicopter and landed at the uh, end of the pier, and uh, and then you know they they put him in that uh, uh, armored limo, and then drove him up to where the ceremony was because they wanted to you know keep him protected all the time. Oh yes. Yeah. Were you on the pier or on the ship at that time? The uh, the. The audience was was all in chairs on the pier, and then they were there was a, a dais that they had built, and uh, the president, the secretary of the navy, the the skipper, and whoever else I can't remember, uh, they were uh, up you know facing us. Okay, uh, anything else remember from the ceremony? No, not okay. that not no. Uh, all right. Now you said there was family there, correct? Oh yeah. All right. Was this called Family Day? No, no. It was. It was. Uh, the, we were allotted you know, so many uh, tickets that we could give to friends and family, so that they could attend the recommissioning ceremony. Okay. I mean, there were the pier was huge, so there was plenty of room, and they they built uh, uh, actually uh, there were almost like bleacher seats. You know, there were. Uh, regular chairs in front of them and then uh, those bleachers as well so there were uh, several hundred people there all right oh, were they allowed on the ship afterwards yeah okay they got tours and so on right. there was a uh, a what we call a cookie fight uh, in the wardroom you know afterwards where it was you know, cookies and and uh, and coffee and things of that sort okay um, I just got a note that your daughters were christened on the ship? Yes. Okay. Uh, when was this? Okay. They they were born April 22nd of 83. So it was about two or three weeks, maybe three. Uh, it, it was either three or four weeks after they were born. And uh, I had known of, of uh, these uh, ceremonies when I was going to communications officer school. Uh, there was a, a guy who had been in my OCS class who was a, a Navy SEAL and he was a navigator as well, or a quartermaster. And uh, uh, before uh, or after he uh, got out of OCS, he, he kind of ran the, the, uh, the brig on uh, the station, naval station there. and. I remember one day seeing uh, this uh, ship uh, over at the, the Navy Pier, and it had uh, all these uh, uh, signal flags flying. And when I read them, it, it spelled out a name. And I went, what the heck? And then there was uh, the, the local uh, base newspaper had an article about it, and it, it spells out what the... Uh, uh, tradition is, but basically, if you're a, a naval, you know, a, a navy member, you can request that uh, you have a christening held aboard the ship. So I went ashore in San Pedro, talked to uh, a, a chaplain there, and uh, he agreed to, to to come over and do it. And basically, what the the tradition says is you uh, hoist. The child's name. Well, I had twin daughters, so they were they used both yard arms, and uh, you hoist their names and signal flags. Well, one of my daughters is named Jennifer, so you know, it took up the whole lanyard, you know. <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, as far as her name was concerned, the other one's name was uh, was Janet. And then they take uh, the ship's bell. And in our case, they took the, the quarterdeck bell, not the, the big you know, New Jersey bell. And uh, they use it as the font. The holy water goes in there. 
And so they uh, did the ceremony uh, and, and so on. It, uh, the one thing they, I don't think they did was after the, the ceremony, the names of the children are to be etched in the, on the inside of the bell. You know, but the uh, one thing they did do is they entered the ceremony, the kids' names, my name, so forth, in the, the deck lock. So somewhere in archives, you know, there's a, an entry that relates to that day uh, in San Pedro when my kids got uh, uh, christened. Okay. Yep. That's a pretty memorable event. Oh, yeah, it was. You said it was in San Pedro, California? Yeah. All right. That's where the Iowa is right now. Uh, that's what I understand. Yep. Oh, yes. That, you see, it, everybody always talks about Long Beach, but where the ship was was San Pedro. Okay. You know? Now, the commissioning ceremony was at Long Beach, just for the store writer, was it? It, it was the same pier we always went to, so technically it was, it was still San Pedro. Oh, still San Pedro? But okay. it basically, yeah, they, they connect to each other, you know. But in order to get to where the New Jersey was, you had to go over the San Pedro Bridge. And when you got on the other side of it, you're in San Pedro. Oh, I see. You know, keep on going a little bit more and you, you end up in the, in the Pacific. <laughs> okay. Now, during the commissioning ceremony, uh, you had tours. So were they guided? Uh, I basically guided by the, uh, the, the people that uh, you know, had invited other people. Okay. Know, ships, ships company, and uh, there wasn't any um, specific uh, route that had to be taken. Uh, they, you couldn't take them uh, in the main, the main control or anything, but it, uh, or uh, down on Broadway, which is just above it. And uh, <clears throat> but you could climb up just about any ladder on the outside. Uh, uh, you could go down to the mess decks. You know all these, you know those kind of things. All right. Okay. So after all this, did you go to sea trials? Uh, we'd already done the the sea trials before the uh, the recommissioning because okay. they had to they had to pass them uh, in order to. You know, get commissioned. Uh, the the guy who ran it, uh, the operation of a post and plant examination group, was a uh, uh, a, a, a retired on active duty uh, former admiral, and you know, everybody was just you know really you know, worried about what he would find and all that kind of stuff. Well, we did actually pretty well. One of the interesting things about that guy is he was the one who was the uh, the boat officer on the the uh, the boat that got uh, MacArthur off of Corregidor and saved him, and you know he, he went on to you know basically make admiral. Oh, yeah. All right. So um, uh, going out to sea in New Jersey, uh, where'd you go next? Okay, there were uh, several you know, workups that, that had to be do, done before we got underway. But the original thing in in June, in fact, it was it was my wife's birthday, June eighth, I think it was, of eighty uh, three. We were supposed to go on a three month shakedown cruise, and during that cruise, we were to go to Honolulu, to Subic Bay, to Pattaya Beach, Thailand. There was uh, uh, Pusan, North Korea, or South Korea, and they, they, there was uh, a push to have us uh, visit Australia as well. And uh, uh, so we, were, we went to Honolulu, we went to Subic, and uh, then, oh, we also went to Singapore. And on the way to Singapore, we crossed the equator. So I've got a uh, uh, a certificate signed by Captain Fogarty uh, from the New Jersey. In fact, I still uh, normally I still carry the the, okay. the wallet version of it. 
right. So, but uh, so I'm a shell back. I'm a trusty shell back. Okay. Yeah. So, so you became a shell back on New Jersey. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So while we're uh, at the uh, conversation, why don't you talk about uh, that ceremony? It is bizarre. Uh, the basically, you've got one of a member of the crew who is the uh, person who ha that has been it's been, it's been the longest time uh, of anybody else on the ship since he uh, crossed the line. Well, he becomes uh, or <coughs> acts as uh, uh, King Neptune. And then there's all several others that uh, you know form uh, the, the that man up Davy Jones locker and things like that. Uh, on, on the morning of the of the ceremony, there's a couple of members of the crew who are taking uh, and uh, given a big jar of, uh, of of water and a uh, funnel, and they I believe they went to the fan tail. And when the, they get word from the bridge that we're, we've, we're crossing, they, they take the water and they pour it into the funnel. Well, in the northern hemisphere, uh, when water empties, it uh, goes in a counterclockwise uh, direction. In a, uh, it, when you're on the equator, it just goes straight down. And when you're south of the equator, it goes in a clockwise direction. I may have this backwards, but that's really what does happen. So a couple of guys have to do that, and then you have to go through uh, an initiation where you crawl through a uh, there's a series of, of bags that were filled with uh, 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 f uh, old food from the from the mess decks, and so you you really got trashed out. Then you came out of that, and you went in front of King Neptune, and King Neptune would decide whether or not you had to, uh, you know, imbibe or take uh, the truth serum. Well, the truth serum was like hot sauce and vinegar and anything else that they could come up with that would make you gag, and you know you had to try to keep it down, and it wasn't it wasn't easy, but. Uh, then finally, when you were done, uh, and it was kind of the help to help uh, clean you up, you took a dive into the uh, uh, the royal swimming pool, which had been you know created on the mess decks or on the uh, flight deck, and uh, they had you know filled it with water, and you could slosh around there and there all you, all you want, but uh, you wanted to be one of the first to go through it. Because if you were one of the last, there was so much stuff in here you didn't want to go in. But it was fun. It okay. was really hilarious. I do remember, uh, however, the guy that uh, was tapped to to be King Neptune uh, was a gunner's mate, first class, who had been called back out of uh, uh, retirement in order to you know help run the, one of the turrets, and. Uh, there was a Master Chief OS that uh, who uh, had been in the Navy for almost 40 years, and he was absolutely certain that he was going to be the uh, the uh, be King, King Neptune. And when they looked at everybody's record and found out that G, that uh, first class gunner's mate, turns out. He had crossed the line in 1943, and that Master Chief in 1944 or 45. So, Master Chief didn't get to be King Neptune, <laughs> and he was fit to be tied. Uh, you know. Oh, another thing they had to do before you went through, you had to uh, wear a pin that said WOG on it, because if you hadn't crossed the line yet, you were a polywog. <laughs> And so uh, we finally got to take those things off when, when the ceremony was over. And that funnel thing is something new. I haven't heard anybody mention that yet. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, uh, they did, s I heard that they whacked you with fire hoses. They oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that was to help, you know, 
<laughs> prod you along, oh. get you going. They called the machine uh, yeah, for, you know, Another thing is right after they got you up, I mean, they made a heck of a lot of noise and, and got you up out of your wreck. They they took you to the to the uh, mess decks for uh, for breakfast and breakfast was uh, was uh, ham and eggs that uh, had green uh, food coloring on them. So it was green eggs and ham. <laughs> wasn't real. Didn't look real good, but it didn't taste bad either. So that one other thing I forgot I remembered. So. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, Captain Bogarty, right? Yeah. Do you remember ever meeting him? Oh yeah, he uh, and Captain Milligan, who was his successor, uh, would. Is, one of the things that skippers do is they invite virtually every member of the wardroom up to uh, supper with them, and uh, it, it's usually just not one on one, but it's you know maybe three, four at a time. And he'll carry on conversations. I mean, when I went, to, uh, I I don't have a, a strong memories of, of uh, dinner with uh, Captain Fogarty, but I do remember uh, with Captain Milligan, because Milligan mentioned at the time that he had a, a twin brother, and we had been talking about my twin daughters. You know, he said, you know, I'm a twin, and I said, oh, really? He says, yeah. Uh, my, my brother's in the in the Marines. Turns out he was a three-star uh, uh, general in the Marines, and uh, his brother, you know, my skipper, was uh, hadn't yet met, gotten his first star, and uh, he had two stars when he did the uh, the investigation into the the uh, explosion on the on the Missouri. You mean uh, Iowa, sir? Pardon me? Was it the Iowa, you mean? Yeah, yeah, it was the, uh, the, the Iowa. And so, you know, he's the one who did the, the investigation uh, on it. And uh, it, uh, he, uh, so he got around. He was, you know, he, he after he left the, the, the Jersey, he uh, got his first star in his second. But, uh, they always had good food in the in the uh, captain's cabin, always. Captain's cabin, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Captain's cabin. And was it the same as what you would see in the either the wardroom or the mess deck? Not well. It could be, but more often than you know, captain had his own uh, uh, his own mess cook and his own uh, uh, stash of or group or allocation of money. You know, for his uh, his food, so he essentially got to eat anything he wanted to. Okay. I I can remember on another ship, the the the, the Kennedy. Uh, they it seemed like every time you went to the captain's cabin to have dinner, you you got served uh, uh, shrimp cocktail. You know, <laughs> and it was good shrimp cocktail too. Okay. Uh, so while we're at the conversation with meals, uh, as a commissioned officer, you could have your meals in the wardroom, right? You always did, and uh, unless you were uh, uh, an officer of the day, uh, of the day or tasked by you know, uh, the XO, I guess, uh, to sample the the mess deck uh, chow, but uh, the as an officer, you took virtually all your uh, uh, meals in the in the wardroom, uh, unless you were going to stand a mid watch, and then you would go to you know mid rats down on the. On the mess deck. Okay. Yeah. You had your meals on uh, the mess deck and the wardroom as well, did you? Yeah. Okay. The the only time I I didn't eat in the wardroom was when I came down with pneumonia during ref tray in 1983, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> uh, they the doctor wouldn't let me you know uh, be among the the rest of the officers, and so they brought my food you know to me. That's the only uh, the only time that was about for three three four days. Okay, so were you in sick bay when they brought to you? No, it was in my my own uh, stateroom. Oh, so they. I didn't have a I didn't have a, a roommate at the time, so okay. you know, there was no uh, problem with that. All right, but you didn't actually dine in the mess deck, did you? Uh, at that time. No, not at that time. They, okay. they brought it to me in my stateroom. Okay. Yeah. But yet, have you ever sat down with the enlisted? Oh, heck and yeah. With them? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
they, you know, the, the New Jersey had some, I thought, some, some pretty darn good mess cooks, you know. Uh, so, because I hardly ever, you know, heard complaints about, you know, the, the food. Uh, if anything, uh, there was too much, you know. Okay. I, there, I had a, one of my men uh, kept trying to, to, to lose weight. And he, he had gotten, you know, down to, you know, just, you know, maybe a couple of meals a day and not that much. And, and yet, no matter what he did, every time he got weighed for the, uh, uh, the program, he, his, uh, he wasn't losing any weight and his body fat percentage wasn't going down. And I said, if you've cut back on all this food, what are you drinking? And he said, uh, uh, bug juice, and bug juice is, is uh, uh, Kool-Aid. And I said, that is almost 100% sugar. He says, Here, here's what I recommend. Drink iced tea, you know, and they, they uh, had a lemon flavor, and don't put any, uh, uh, any sugar in it. Or if you can find, you know, some, uh, like sweet and low or something like that, put that in there so you get that sweet flavor. And w once he started doing that, the fat just came right off him and he got off the program. Oh. Yeah. But he was having a heck of a time because the mess decks just had too much good stuff to eat. All right, uh, while, we're, while we're at the war room, do you remember any uh, proper etiquette that was enforced? Well, Whenever the captain came in, you know, it was all, you know, attention on deck. Of course, that was true anywhere he went. Uh, I don't recall any, any, anything specific. I know that the, the uh, XO was uh, normally the first one to go through the line. And then, you know, it was everybody for yourself uh, after that. Uh, and if he wasn't going to make it, then he would send word to the to the wardroom uh, mess cooks that I won't be eating in the wardroom tonight. So just you know serve and go. Mm -hmm. And so, but uh, I remember one time I you know we were watching uh, a a movie and it started off with uh, the a picture of the of the flag and the playing of the Star Spangled Banner. So I jumped up and stood at attention during the whole thing, and I got most of the wardroom to do it too, but that's not really required either. You, know, you don't do it in a movie, but uh, that's just a, you know, my sense of humor. <laughs> right. uh, anything else you remember um, from either the wardroom or interactions with the captain or the XO before we talk about like your sea duties? No, not at all. No. Okay, all right. So, uh, what were your duties on the New Jersey at this time? Okay, my I was the my office was the uh, main engine. I was the main engines officer. And on any other ship, it would be the M division officer. But uh, there were four main engines, uh, uh, essentially, where they took the steam and and then. Uh, used the steam to turn the shaft and, uh, and the propellers. And so I had 170 uh, men who worked for me, uh, a, a, an E9 to kind of run everything, two E8s to help him, and four E7s, one for each of the four engine rooms. Uh, later, they, uh, we got an ensign on board, uh, and he became my assistant. And essentially what he did is he took over uh, running all the men who worked in the shaft alleys uh, and you know, uh, tending to the bearings back there and also the, the pumps, that, most of which were in the fire room that uh, helped uh, you know, provide the, uh, the boilers with uh, 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 condensate. And the... Uh, uh, that took a, a big load off me, but I still had he, you know, I still had to write the evaluations for all these guys, and so it seemed like I was always at my desk if I wasn't on watch, 
uh, writing somebody's evaluation. And for, you know, 170 men, that was something else. Uh, before I left, I actually wrote the command endorsements for, uh, for three of my, of my men who were either going up for, uh, well, that were going up for LDO or chief foreign officer. <clears throat> and uh, one of them was a uh, frocked chief. He was a first class and he had made chief probably as early as you can, and but he wasn't being paid for chief yet. And uh, I wrote, you know, all these uh, command endorsements. Every one of them got picked up except that frocked chief. And so about a year later, they put it back in after he'd had a year as a chief petty officer. And uh, the, all they did was change the cover letter date and send it in with no changes at all, and he got selected number one. Later in my career, uh, when I was at the Atlantic Fleet Training Command, he became, uh, he once again worked for me because he was running the firefighting uh, training in, uh, in oh, uh, Fleet Training Center, uh, it's right near Jacksonville. You know, I, but it was not Jack's. So it, uh, it, yeah, it was. That was where it was. Or no, Charleston. Fleet Training Center of Charleston. And so technically he worked for me again. He was an interesting guy too because he uh, collected uh, baseball memorabilia. And he had a, a baseball signed by Babe Ruth, uh, a bat signed by Joe DiMaggio. I mean, this guy. He was something else. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay, so uh, when did you arrive to uh, Beirut, on New Jersey? It was uh, mid to late September of '83. Uh, okay. And you know we we had uh, come across the well came out of the Panama Canal, raced through. Uh, uh, the Gulf of uh, uh, the Caribbean, and uh, off of Roosevelt Roads, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Captain Milligan relieved Captain Fogarty. We had a change of command right in the middle of the water, and then we uh, put the engines back on full again, and uh, four or five later, a few days later, we were off Beirut, and when we got there, the, the Syrians quit shelling. Because I think we surprised him. We were there a day early. Okay. Uh, yeah. The Jersey just arrived there, right? Didn't fire any shots, did it? No. It, it wasn't until this, or January okay. that uh, we uh, ever re returned fire. I don't think we. Maybe there was a time in early December. Uh, but uh, the, the big shelling was uh, in January. Okay. Yeah. Uh, prior to arriving there, uh, you, you were kept informed. You and the crew were kept informed about the conflict over there, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in fact, uh, there were uh, uh, before we went to uh, uh, to the mouth of the or the Pacific side of the Panama Canal to go through it. There had been on the news a uh, an incident where I think there were four service members, U.S. service members, that were killed in Beirut, and you know I uh, they said await further orders, and I put two and two together and I said, man, we're going to Beirut, and so we had to cut all the scuppers off the side because they would grate on the sides of the or the walls of the uh, uh, the locks. In the Panama Canal, without those scuppers on there, uh, the battleship was the the last major ship that was specifically designed to fit through that Panama Canal. So we fit through it, and then the HTs had to, you know, build new scuppers and put them on there, whatever they could. But uh, you know, it it was quite quite of the experience. One of the things I remember about that that day going through the the canal was there was a princess cruise ship in the going the other way in the lock right next to ours 
and uh, there was uh, guys are uh, throwing them uh, belt buckles, battleship belt buckles, and and uh, stuff like that as souvenirs. And there was one guy who yelled over, says, "Is there a petty officer? You know, I can't remember his last name uh, over there. He's my son, and I knew him." And so I called down to main control, says, get somebody to relieve uh, MM2, uh, whatever his name, I can't remember his name, and uh, have him come up to the, to the uh, flight deck uh, because there's another ship going by and his mom and dad are on it. And within about well, two, three minutes, he shows up, they, they get to say hi to each other, and then, you know, it, uh, we went up, they went down, and we continued on. And you haven't experienced, uh, some, uh, there, there's nothing like the experience of being on uh, a, something as heavy as a battleship and being raised about, I mean, about that fast. I mean, you're, you're going up about 20 feet in just a matter of seconds. And that's the power of, uh, of hydraulics of water. Yeah. Oh, yes. It was something else. Oh, yes, indeed. Okay, so um, yeah, we're on the topic of uh, Beirut, Lebanon. Do you remember first arriving there? Yeah, and, that's, and all we did was, as the, the term is, uh, cut holes in the ocean for, <clears throat> for months. Uh, got there in September. Uh, October 23rd, you know, which is what we're commemorating today, uh, was just barely a, a, a month later. Um, and, you know, we, you could see the city, you could see people, uh, you know, at night you could see tracers, you know, from, from gunfire and so forth. Uh, you could see explosions where people you know, were blowing something up. Uh, um, but there's, you know, as far as what we did, it was uh, essentially the same thing every day. And uh, you, you finally got to the point where you had to find something to get your you know, uh, mind off it. So I, I kept going to the library and, and getting books and reading because it, it helped you cope. Uh, can you tell us the events leading up to um, the unfortunate fateful day? I was kind of insulated from it, uh, as far as uh, you know, being in uh, uh, in engineering, because you know I wasn't on the bridge; I was down there. I, mean, I wasn't. Uh, I would find out about things because. You know, you were we were able to uh, read the the message traffic that uh, that related, and I was you know so busy trying to run that division that uh, the all I knew about what was going on was what I read in my in my message traffic. Others, uh, you know, much junior officers, were actually having to qualify for uh, you know bridge watches. Uh, so they were more attuned, uh, like that ensign that I mentioned before, uh, with what was happening, you know, outside uh, ma uh, the mains. <clears throat> but uh, I would find out about it from uh, the main propulsion assistant officer or the uh, the chief engineer when he would do eight o'clock reports, you know, and uh, and or uh, quarters in the, in the morning. I had, speaking of quarters and, and eight o'clock reports, it was so hard to muster every, all the men that what I ended up doing was I would talk to the master chief and the senior chiefs and the four chiefs, and that was quarters. And then they would go and spread the word of what I had just put out uh, to their uh, divisions at night so that they could stay up on top of things. I would uh, write out and then mimeograph or, uh, Xerox off a thing that I called the uh, uh, M Division Mail. 
had a, I drew a picture of a, of a buoy on it and, and called it the mail buoy. And I would write, uh, uh, tell the, the, the crew what I'd been told at 8 o'clock reports, and uh, I would distribute it to each one of the uh, engine rooms so that they could pass it around and find out and keep on t in touch with what was going on. So, you know, as far as uh, the, the the lead up, there never was any kind of a of a feeling uh, other than they were constantly, uh, you know, uh, noticing you know that there was fighting going on. There was a civil war going on in in, in Lebanon, and uh, the the art division officer every once in a while would uh, have to go over there to uh, help the Marines uh, with you know, certain things. Same thing with Ch uh, Chief Kroczynski. You know, he would go and, and troubleshoot the electronic gear that they had. And, uh, but uh, as, as they were leading up to the morning of, of 23 October of, uh, of 83, you, uh, the the bombing of the barracks was a big surprise. They hadn't done anything like that before, and they didn't do it after that either. They, even though they probably tried. Do you, do you remember me, meeting Master Chief Wojcicki? Yeah, okay. yeah, a couple of times. Uh, I th um, it was in passing or on the on the quarter deck, but I knew of him and. Uh, uh, I, you know, was you know, kind of uh, impressed with him because here was a guy who himself was a was a marksman, and uh, he was uh, essentially you know, they said he was a lead a, a leader in being uh, selected to represent the U.S. in the Olympics in uh, Los Angeles in the summer of '84. And they say that he would have uh, uh, qualified for it. I don't know where he got the time to practice, but he may, probably was just a, uh, a a crack shot. Period. Um, but uh, he was a relatively uh, big guy, and I remember him showing me around. Uh, uh, I think it was either CIC or C. Yeah, CIC. Uh, uh, a few times, and CEC, which is where they, they uh, controlled the, the big guns. Okay. So, so after the bombing, uh, a lot of the crew members went ashore, right? Yeah, they, there were several that uh, volunteered. The, uh, the R Division officer had been, you know, he had come off the bid watch, and so he was out jogging on the flight deck. Uh, you know, before, you know, between 6 and 6.30, and it was 20, 6.20 when uh, the bomb went off, and uh, it stopped him, and he, he heard it, and then he started seeing the smoke come up, so he immediately ran to his stateroom, changed into his uh, work uniform, and then hightailed it to the bridge to uh, talk to the skipper, and the skipper tasked him with getting uh, some men together, get all the things that you need, and go over to the barracks and uh, do whatever you can to help, and if you can, find Chief Korchinski. And so he uh, went back to his division, talked to his men. His entire division wanted to go over to, uh, to the barracks, and he, he picked nine of them, and uh, he uh, which meant, you know, the rest of them had to double up watches, uh, <clears throat> and went over on the first helo. They also had, the ship had passed the word for other volunteers. Well, I, ha I know for a fact that at least 10 or more of my men went over uh, to, to help out. Uh, and so there were several helos that uh, flew over there full of guys, you know, and for four or five days, all they did was move rock, rubble, and try to find people. Every once in a while, they would uh, find someone who had survived, but most of the time, they would find uh, body parts and people 
and things of that sort. I had a really, you know, he was a kind of a man mountain dean kind of uh, guy, second class petty officer, I think he was, that worked for me uh, in, May, in you know, M Division. And uh, he went over, at this big tough guy, uh, after about the third day of doing this, uh, he, he you know, just couldn't do it anymore. It was, it was really getting to him. Uh, some of the men ended up getting uh, medevaced uh, to, uh, I think it was Sigadella in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, because they just couldn't handle the, uh, what they had seen and, and smelled and heard and so forth. Uh, I, I still can see that, that, that petty officer in my mind's eye. Uh, it, uh, it, you know, not only shook him, you know, it shook me too because you you can't you got to feel for a guy, you know. I understand. Anything else you remember from that incident? No, all I all I you know re remember uh, uh, vividly is when we finally got even. Okay. Yeah. Now we were part of a multinational peacekeeping force. Uh, did you ever interact with any? Uh, service members from the other nations? Uh, yeah, but you know, we never got to go ashore, so it wasn't ashore. At, at one point, a uh, French corvette, which is kind of like a frigate, uh, invited uh, members of our wardroom over to their ship and, you know, to give us, you know, uh, to say hello, give us a tour, have lunch, and so forth. And uh, uh, it must have been six or seven of us that, that went over there, maybe ten, and uh, had a, a nice uh, a nice lunch, you know, light lunch, and they you know, showed us you know all the their engineering spaces and things of that sort, and uh, before we left, they said we must have a toast, and so out comes a, a couple of bottles of Moet et Chandon uh, champagne, and. You know, each one of us got a glass, but most of us hadn't had a drink to drop in uh, over a hundred days. So this was really something, you know. And uh, I think, well, even though it, there's, it was just one glass, I think we all kind of felt it, you know. <laughs> but that that was a, a big uh, hit. And uh, apparently at the time, we made a a, uh, a promise to the to the French because they showed that kind of hospitality to us, uh, that if we ever left Beirut, we would make a, uh, a, uh, a stop in uh, a French port and repay the, you know, the, give them, you know, the, repay the favor. And so we, on the way back, we actually stayed at uh, several days at Ville France, which is like halfway between uh, Les Antibes uh, where Can you know, near where Can is, and uh, Monte Carlo, and so several people got to go up to uh, either one of those places in there. It's absolutely beautiful. Okay, uh, now do you remember the events leading up to New Jersey actually firing back? Yeah, I had. You know, they had set up R and R flights uh, because we didn't know when we were going home. And uh, I was on the, the, the second iteration of them in early January, uh, actually late December, early January. And uh, so I got to see my, my twins take their first steps and uh, you know, be there you know, uh, for them. Uh, and, my my wife was completely different. You know, she had had to run everything ever you know since I left, and these were our first and, and only kids, and so she was learning as she went. Uh, well, I got to fly back the morning after the 1984 Super Bowl that uh, I believe the Raiders won, and uh, uh, you fly back you fly into Larnaca, Cyprus, and then they put you on a helicopter and take you out, out to the ship. And so that was you know, like mid-January, and it was either late January or early February 
that uh, we uh, finally opened up. And I can remember uh, being in the wardroom, and it got dark kind of early you know, there, and having uh, supper. And all of a sudden, the whole ship shakes. And we started it started shelling them, and it shelled all night. And you know, luckily, I think I had a midwatch that night, so I, I didn't really need a lot of sleep. It was <laughs> I was going to be up anyway. But they shelled all all uh, all that night, and at least half of the next day, and uh, really did a number on uh, the. <coughs> command and control positions and, and guns that the Syrians had on the hills, uh, technically mountains, above Beirut from where they'd been shelling. And uh, years later, uh, they declassified the, the battle damage assessment and essentially it said, that it showed the pictures of uh, the emplacements uh, on the top of the mountain before and Afterwards, they were gone. There wasn't a thing left. You know, so the the, the sixteen inchers, you know, did their job. Yes, certainly. Do you remember the five inch guns firing as well? Yeah, they did. Uh, we'd get in real close to shore, and every once in a while they'd shoot them. Uh, the, the 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 mesh cooks didn't like that though, because whereas the the big guns are attached to the keel, when the big gun shot. It only kind of made the the ship shudder, but when the five inch went off, they're only attached to the deck that they're on, and there's quite a, a pop to them, and so when when they would you know shoot uh, the, uh, them off, then it, you would you would feel a, or hear a louder bang, and then it would literally shake the ship, and the, the reason the mess cooks didn't like it is all the stuff that they thought they'd cleaned out of the overhead came out of the overhead and, and they had to clean all of it up again and every time the the five inch shot especially they you know had to get out their dust pads and, and uh, uh, brushes and clean off as, as well as they could I mean one of the best things about the wardroom was where the the salads and stuff was that you know that was covered, so it never got you know hit with any of that debris. But, but it was you know, it was you had to watch where you were sitting if shelling was going on and you were trying to eat, because if you were under you know a pipe or something running through the bulkhead, you know stuff could come out. <laughs> okay. uh, <coughs> anything else you remember from the shelling at Beirut? Just that uh, it seemed to me like when it started, especially, uh, there was a kind of a roar that went up from the crew. You could hear it, you know, uh, on uh, the coming out of the main spaces if you were in Bro uh, Broadway, uh, uh, and you could hear it through sound power phones if you were uh, if you had them on, you know, at the, at that time. So. <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the crew was really happy that we were, you know, doing something. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, after this, you uh, left Beirut? Yeah, it was uh, just uh, a few months later. Uh, there, things apparently were quieting down, and uh, the Iowa was getting closer to being ready to come out and relieve us. And so uh, we, I, I wasn't involved in it, but uh, apparently they were making preps to, uh, uh, to leave early, you know, okay. because things had quieted down a bit. Uh, and I can remember getting up uh, one morning in, in April, and I was going through the relieving process because I was getting ready to transfer. and. Uh, so I didn't really have a lot to do with them because I'd already turned over everything to the my replacement. And uh, let's see, the uh, my stateroom was just after the wardroom on the port side, 
And so you, what I would do is come out of my stateroom, go forward to the ladder, go down the ladder, hang a right, and I was in the wardroom. And <coughs> uh, often they would leave a, uh, a one of the uh, watertight doors to the weather open because it helped ventilate the, the ship. And uh, this time it wasn't open because it was still kind of cool out. But I took a, a, and opened it and kind of peered out and it started looking around. And normally you looked off the side of the ship and you saw mountains. And I looked off the side of the ship and there were no mountains. And I looked to where the sun was and I realized we're heading west. And we never headed west. It was always north and south off of Beirut, yeah. you know. So I said, oh my God, we're going home. And sure enough, a few days later, we, we visit Villefranc. We're there for about three days or so. Okay. Uh, and then we pick up Anchor and leave the bed. And just before, well, just as the ship was passing Rota, Spain, uh, that Rota sent out a, what we call a mic boat. And uh, several of us who were transferring got in it, went ashore, probably waited a day for uh, a flight. And then uh, you know, I flew out of that. What's interesting is uh, I, uh, when the kids, my twins, were six weeks old is when we left on the shakedown cruise. The, the day I got back was their birthday, their first birthday. Oh, wow. So that was a, you know, you know, really cool, I thought. Okay. Uh, you left the ship April of 84, was it? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, before we leave the New Jersey, you remember Bob Hope and his entourage oh, coming yeah. on board? Yeah, okay. I was, I, it, it, yeah, I, I remember the, the whole thing. I sat uh, off to the right of the stage, which would have been on the, on the port side, and it was, I was relatively close. And I had my camera with me, and I took pictures of Bob and Brooke Shields and uh, Vic Damone and uh, everybody else that was, uh, you know, part of his troop. And uh, uh, when we got home, uh, uh, and I you know, thoroughly enjoyed the, the concert, uh, the Art Division officer got tasked to be the escort for uh, Brooke Shields, too. And we always thought he was the luckiest guy ever. The, uh, but, and, and we also saw uh, Wayne Newton uh, give a, a USO performance and his was outstanding too and I took pictures of it. Well, when I got home, we still were living in uh, Huntington Beach. I hadn't uh, transferred to my shore duty station yet. And uh, I took my uh, film uh, over to, to uh, get it processed and, and get the pictures. Well, uh, I'm not sure how he got my phone number, but uh, he must have been something I had to fill out. But when this guy started, you know, doing these pictures and he realized who they were of, he actually uh, uh, asked me, "Hey, uh, do you mind you know, uh, if I make some uh, blow-ups of, of these, and you know, I can hang them here?" And, and use them as uh, examples of my work, you know, that kind of stuff. And I said, yeah. And he says, okay, and then, you know, the, the processing's gonna be free to you. It works for me. I've still got those pictures somewhere. But uh, he, he you, you wouldn't believe when you walked into that guy's uh, store and you'd see uh, every major, you know, uh, player, and it's you know, super close and it was beautiful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else you remember from New Jersey before we um, talk about your next duty? I think I've covered just about everything. <laughs> okay. So after that, you were transferred to the um, uh, Can Can Canteo, was it? Well, I, I went to shore duty first uh, at the uh, to to teach uh, naval science and, and navigation for engineers at California Maritime Academy. Okay. And uh, while I was there, I uh, you know, essentially uh, qualified for uh, uh, department head school, uh, and that so that just after 
uh, Canis, or, uh, Cal Maritime is when I went to first do uh, department head school and uh, but uh, I was you know it said right on the orders I was specializing in engineering and so my first department head tour was as a <coughs> chief engineer on this ancient oiler that had been jumboized uh, during the 1960s uh, so it was like six or eight hundred feet long it had a 400 pound PSI boiler most Navy ships are 600 or 1200 so this was really odd the blue boil to its main engine and it had one it had, yeah one shaft the lube oil was fed to it by a uh, uh, not by a lube oil pump but by it was gravity fit there was a lube oil pump that was attached to the sump of that main uh, engine gear and it pumped the oil up to this uh, holding uh, vat uh, up on the O4 level on the aft part of the ship and then it would feed via uh, gravity back down to the to the gear it was the system was set up so that if for some reason uh, we lost all you know, uh, the, the pump went out or something like that there was still enough time for that oil to fill the sump uh, and we could get the shaft locked until we fish, uh, fix the pump uh, but it was really a strange, uh, a strange ship as far as engineering was concerned. <clears throat> My stateroom was right outside the four strap blower room. And uh, four strap blowers operate at 3,000 RPM or 3 kilohertz. And uh, I slept with my, uh, my left ear up most of the time. And as it turns out, uh, all that force draft blower wine when we were underway uh, made me partially deaf in my, in my left ear. Uh, when I went to the JFK, my stateroom was also near where the force draft blowers were, so it bombarded it again. So I got a little bit more than 30% uh, lost there. But when I reported to her, she was, uh, she had tried to pass the Operational Propulsion Plan Examination, or OPI, at least twice, and couldn't do it, because she, it was just so old and things just didn't work right. So I take over for a guy who darn near did it, and uh, we try it once, and we came that close and you know something went wrong and uh, we didn't pass uh, <clears throat> we finally tried one more time uh, we got the sh you know, one of the problems was we'd get the ship underway and then the lube oil would get cloudy well, you can't operate that way according to Oppie and so what we did but usually in a day or so it cleared up so we got underway and we're out by Chesapeake Bay light and the uh, uh, the oil clears up, and so we brought the uh, the Oppie members out to the ship via boat, and then went through the the uh, the Oppie again. This time we passed it, and we were the first uh, ship of that class to ever pass Oppie. In fact, I think we're the only one that ever did. Uh, but uh, that's if you're you know if you're wondering where all this white hair came from, that's the experience that turned my hair white because mm -hmm. it was uh, a constant battle to keep that ship going. Right. Are we talking about the Canisteo? That's the Canisteo, right. Okay. It's named for a, a river in southern uh, New York. All right. And just to clarify, it's a converted, uh, it was a converted? It, it was uh, a, a, uh, an AO, which is auxiliary oiler. Okay. Uh, but in the 1960s, they uh, needed you know, more capacity. And so what they did is they, they chopped the hull in half and put a whole new section in there. 
and, and then welded it all back up. And so it like doubled its uh, uh, capacity to hold oil as well as fresh water. We had a, a tank up front that had hundreds of thousands of gallons of fresh water. So if we wanted to, we didn't have to make our own water. We could you know, draw from that. But uh, that was there in case you know, a ship came alongside and it needed water for whatever purpose. You know, we had it. Okay. Yep. okay. And uh, so let's talk about getting transferred to the John F. Kennedy. Okay. So, uh, what was your first impression of seeing an aircraft carry that close? Oh, if, if, if you're in awe when you come on a battleship, then a carrier is, is uh, something else. Because you got to climb a heck of a long way just to get to where uh, you can come aboard. If you, most carriers, they'll have some kind of an access to uh, to the main deck that's, uh, you know, uh, in a, a bulkhead. You know, it doesn't look, it's not where the flight deck is, the main deck is, is way below. So, uh, <coughs> It was massive. I mean, the, the the mooring lines were about the same as on the New Jersey. The the anchors were about the same as on the New Jersey, but uh, everything else was just immense. I mean, six acres of flight deck. You know, uh, the 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 bridge being on the 08 level. I mean, it, it's just it was crazy big. <laughs> Okay, so when did you get on the Kennedy? That was uh, June, I believe, of 1981. Let me think. No, 84. to 86. I was going through department head school. Uh, 87 to 89 was when I was on the Canisteo. So it would have been uh, 1989, June of, 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 of 89. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Okay. June, June of 89 is when I reported and uh, I left here uh, in uh, April, I think it was, of uh, 91. Okay. So you were on board during operations under shield and under storm, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, anything you want to talk about those well, operations? Yeah. The uh, as a deck department head, I was in charge of uh, of uh, controlling really all the underway replenishments, and you know the uh, the aircraft carrier would take on fuel from uh, Oilers because. The Kennedy was a conventional carrier, it wasn't a, a nuke. Uh, and they would also transfer goods to, to other ships. Uh, so, but nevertheless, it was my bosun's mates who were handling the pallets, uh, sending the shot lines over, really doing everything for it. Well, I happen to believe I had the best bosun in the, in the Navy who taught all these guys how to do what they were supposed to do. And in a normal deployment, you'll do maybe uh, on a carrier, you'll do 45 or 50 underway replenishments, you know, which is like maybe one a week. But during Desert Shield and Desert Storm, we did over 100 of them. And we did so without a single accident, uh, without a single incident or injury nor did we ever lose a pallet or have a spill when it came to the, to the oil and, <coughs> and other fluids. So, you know, that's a, that's a big feather. We're, we also, whenever we did get a chance to, to go into port, my guys ran the boats that, you know, you know, first of all, the captain's gig, and then the motor whale boats for all the rest of us. <coughs> and. The, you know, so they had to maintain them and keep them up, drive them, and you know, all that kind of, of, of thing. And uh, so, uh, you know, we, we whatever we did, the, the bosun's mates seemed to have been involved, and they <clears throat> they did a terrific job, 
you know, ferrying captain around and uh, doing things of that sort. One, one thing we do remember is you know, we, we didn't get much time off. Uh, when, during Desert Shield, the, the captain got permission to, to go visit uh, a place in Turkey. And so we got a little bit of time off uh, for, for, for that. And the guys got to go ashore. Uh, there was another time that we tried to put into uh, Alexandria, but the, the water was so choppy it wasn't safe to put anybody ashore, so we left. Uh, but because we didn't get a chance to, to go anywhere, uh, the Navy had a, a thing where if you were underway for 45 days without a port visit, then you could uh, you know, break out uh, two beer, a two-beer ration to each member of the crew and have a steel beach picnic. And, you know, basically they, uh, you know, there had to be so many hours between when they had the two beers uh, and had to go on watch. And that, that was really the only restriction, but it was, it was a lot of fun. We got to do that on the Kennedy twice during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. On the New Jersey, we never did. And so as far as I'm concerned, the Navy still owes me eight beers. Good. Now, uh, uh, events leading up to uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, uh, yeah. Saddam Hussein invading. Uh, do you remember uh, anything from there? Like any sorties the well, like participated? We went through the uh, the, the Panama Canal, or not Panama, uh, Suez, Suez yeah. Canal, and, and I'd done that when I was a uh, navigator on the Concord too, and so I was kind of familiar with what I would see. But to do it on such a huge ship really you know, fascinated me. Because it was so big, it, the, the, the uh, Kennedy didn't have to stop in the Great Bitter Lake and anchor uh, and wait for the northbound convoy to go. They essentially said, no northbound convoy until the Kennedy's out. Uh, I also knew what it was like going through the Gulf of Suez and then finally uh, the, the Red Sea. So I kind of knew what to expect. But one of the, the things that happened during Desert Shield was, you know, the, the rest of the, of the ship had to uh, get ready, you know, in, in case we went to war. And so there were a lot of flight ops. And uh, there was one in particular where the uh, Marine, or no, not the Marine Detachment, they, uh, there were a couple of uh, helicopters that were carrying Navy SEALs. And uh, I'm not sure what caused it to happen, but one of the helicopters uh, had to set down in the Red Sea. In other words, it you know, crashed. Uh, but because he had con control, he was able to do it without you know hurt, hurting anyone. So they, they got everybody out. They had flotation devices, I guess. But, uh, and the Red Sea was pretty warm, but that day it was pretty choppy, too. Uh, the other helicopter picked up you know, most of the, the, the crew and the other guys, and then uh, I directed uh, a motor whale boat that was manned by my, my bosun, uh, a, uh, one of my chiefs, and uh, I think about eight or ten guys. And they took the, the motor whale boat out there, I think they also had a corpsman with them. And uh, I was using a walkie-talkie to tell the bosun, okay, you, you're probably about 50 yards from them. They should, you should be seeing them bob above a, a swell pretty soon. And uh, he you know, would roger that and he would see them and stuff. Well, they picked up those uh, 15 uh, Navy SEALs. Nobody was hurt, everybody survived. Brought him back to the ship, got him some some warm clothing and stuff, and then a day or two later they probably uh, uh, flew off. But you know, my guys rescued 15 seals. You know, when their chopper went down, we were really proud of that. I made sure that uh, all of the men in the boat either got a Navy commendation or a Navy achievement medal for what they had done because it wasn't easy. That, that was pretty you know high. Uh, chop that they were having to go through. 
Yeah. yeah. Another thing that I remember during the, the lead up uh, to Desert Storm was uh, we had some people from, I think it was Grumman, uh, come out to the, to the ship during the fall. And somebody had uh, raised the uh, question, you know, could you put an avionics package on there and hang a tomahawk from an A6? A6 and right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was basically it was a fighter bomber. And uh, they said, well, yeah, we probably could put something here and something there. So during the fall, they come out and they tried it. They put the package on there. They put uh, a something to hold uh, the, uh, the tomahawk uh, to it. And when the war started, there were uh, there was a video that you could see on uh, CNN uh, several days after it happened, but there, they had rigged a, a camera was rigged to the nose of a tomahawk, and you know, it was sending back you know, you know live TV uh, to probably the Kennedy, and uh, you could see it approaching this uh, brick. Uh, building, and it had a a, uh, a fire escape coming out from the second story, and at the top of the fire escape there was a door with the, a glass you know pane in it, and what that tomahawk did was came out of the sky. You could see the building, you could see the door, you could see the the uh, glass, and then you don't see anything anymore. It was that accurate. Well. That that uh, A6 that shot that was the one from the A6. First time it was ever done, and I don't know if they've ever done it since. But it was fascinating. We we knew, you know, what uh, those things could do. Okay. Anything else remember from operations of storm? Yeah. Another, the, one of the interesting things is when you know they uh, uh, launched all the the sorties to to you know do a number on Baghdad, uh, the, they were, uh, there were ships shooting tomahawks, there were uh, you know, uh, planes that uh, I think were shooting tomahawks too, but mostly ships. And they had, you know, some of them had quite a few of them. Well, one of the neat things about tomahawks is you can set waypoints, navigation waypoints, so they can, even though you're south of where they uh, were shot from, the device can come in from any direction. And so we were messing with the, uh, the, the Iraqis because they would see, you know, a tomahawk come in from the north, and so all the anti-aircraft would be shooting that way, you know, their uh, guns, anti-aircraft guns. And then another group of tomahawks would come in from the west, and so they'd swing over there. And as soon as they started shooting that way, they one would come from the south or the north or the east. They didn't know where to shoot, you know. So that was, you know, I was really uh, proud of that. I thought that was really clever that we figured out how to how to do that. But it's also one of the things that forced them to capitulate so quickly. You know, they 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 gave up real quick. I can remember seeing the, the video of uh, their vaulted army, you know, in a straight line, you know, walking through the dunes, you know, to wherever they were going to be held. Quick. Quite a time. Yeah, that was a swift conflict. Right, so uh, after Operation Desert Storm, uh, you returned home? Yeah, okay. and by that time it was, uh, that was March of 91. And in April or May, uh, that's when I transferred to, to uh, Commander uh, Training Command, U.S. Atlantic Fleet, or Com Trayland. Okay. It, it doesn't exist anymore. It got absorbed into uh, 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 Sinclair Fleet. Okay. So, right. but uh, when I went there, I was the uh, staff engineer because of all my engineering experience. And so I ran the, the training programs for all the, the engineering ratings on the East Coast. 
Uh, I was the training program coordinator and curriculum control authority uh, for all the Navy's firefighting worldwide. And I was the same uh, for at least half of the chemical, biological, and radiological defense training that started in boot camp and you know, essentially you know, throughout uh, anybody's career. Uh, as a, a part of that, I would uh, have to go to a training program requirements meetings uh, that invited members of the fleet, officers and enlisted, uh, the uh, guys who were teaching those, uh, uh, like say, engine men or uh, boiler techs or whatever, and <clears throat> they would make, rec the teachers especially, especially, would make recommendations about, we need to modify this course to do that, or we need to add this course, you know, because a machinist made, needs to know that, and so on. And uh, so it was a lot of fun sometimes, uh, and you learned a lot when you, you know, sat around and uh, talked about what do you guys want, what do you guys need, and we would come up with uh, uh, ideas about what to do. I would share that with the Admiral. The Admiral would say, sounds good to me, make it happen. And uh, then it, it would go to uh, Lant Fleet, and uh, Lant Fleet would have the, the final uh, decision, and then Chief of Naval Education and Training uh, would essentially you know, uh, make it happen for the the rest of the of the Navy, uh, because you know when you talk about rate training, you know that's Navy wide. Uh, one of the most interesting ones of those meetings that I ever had was the last one I ever went to. And it was at Great Lakes uh, near C uh, Chicago, and uh, my name is Shepard, spelled S H E P P E R D. And the uh, assistant to the chief of naval education and training was a, was also a guy named Shepard, and he was at that meeting, but he didn't spell it the same way I did. He spelled it like Alan Shepard, the astronaut, did. Okay, so you got two guys at the meeting, two different spellings for the same name. Okay, or at least it sounds the same. Then there was a master chief uh, who came from the fleet. I had served with him when he was on the John F. Kennedy, and uh, so, and his name was Shepard. His was two P's A R D, and then there were two others. Uh, so now we've got three in the room, all named Shepard, all three spelling it differently. Then uh, the there's a, a commander who came from the fleet, and there was a, I think a first class engineman who came from the fleet. And both of them were named Shepard, and they both spelled it differently. So we had in one room five people running that show, all with the same last name, and neither one of us spelled it the same. It was funny as heck. We had a picture you know, taken of all of us because it, it was just too unbelievable. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, the Kennedy was the last ship you served in, right? Right. Yeah. Through, uh all the ships you served in. Did you have any encounters with the Soviets? Um, I'm trying to remember. On the Concord, my first ship, I can remember seeing them uh, way off in the distance. They didn't. Uh, they didn't come close. Uh, when I was on the uh, Canisteo, that was about as close as they ever came, but they were still a couple of miles off. You know, they were just curious. Why are you here? You know, we we'd see a lot of uh, of uh, Russian uh, uh, freighters. You know, because they did trade with you know all the uh, countries you know in and around Europe too, and you could tell what they were because they'd have the hammer and sickle on their uh, smokestack, uh, but never had any uh, you know close calls with them. Uh, I can't remember if they ever got close to the to the Jersey. Uh, I know they didn't get close to the to the Kennedy. 
they may have gotten close to the the planes that they were flying, but you know they, they couldn't get past uh, any uh, cruiser or frigate that was you know part of the protection for the high value unit. You know. oh, yes. All right. So uh, you left the Navy in 1994, right? Right. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, uh, what was your process of uh, leaving the Navy? And uh, why don't you talk about like your post-Navy life briefly? Okay. Uh, the, the process is you know, essentially like, you know, going to a different command. But you, uh, uh, you, you go through a, a, you know, a turnover to, to your replacement first. And that really doesn't take that long. If you've got your, uh, your things in order, then it's just a matter of sign here, sign for that, sign here, and I relieve you, I stay relieved. And <clears throat> uh, then what, what's interesting is, when, in my case, that happened in June of 94. Well, I've still got until September before my uh, release date is. And so, you know, they essentially let me uh, you know, uh, take some leave and come up uh, uh, to uh, where we were going to live in Pennsylvania, and I put in resumes to try to get teaching jobs and stuff, but uh, really wasn't very fruitful. Uh, but you know, that was you know maybe a week or so in uh, or two weeks in in June, uh, and then I did it again in August. When we moved all my uh, my wife's and my my family's stuff up to my wife's mother's house, and uh, and moved out really of our old house, uh, everything else went into storage, and uh, then the with two weeks to go, I go back down to uh, to Norfolk. Uh, I get a a BOQ room in uh, Damneck, Virginia. Uh, and uh, I essentially just you know go do a, a little bit of paperwork at uh, uh, at Trailet, and then they would knock me off around noon. <laughs> uh, I would also you know, it, it hit up uh, places that I had to touch base with. I had to have a physical before I left, so I had to pass the physical. Uh, there was a there was a run that you had to accomplish. And I, I got that done too. Uh, the, you had to go to uh, a, a purse up debt, you know, a personnel support detachment, and uh, talk to the, uh, the uh, dispersing clerks and, and others. And <coughs> what they would do is essentially make sure uh, everything <coughs> was accounted for correctly and that I was set up for uh, my retirement and the amount that it would be. And uh, then there were also uh, classes that they set up for guys that were uh, you know, retiring or, yeah, re retiring, leaving the service. <coughs> and, you know, they essentially taught you uh, the same kind of things, who to contact, uh, where, where do you or your family go to to get new uh, or replacement uh, ID cards made? Uh, and then finally, the the day I left, I had to go to the the support detachment uh, at Norfolk, and uh, I you know it was on my way home, and I had to wear my my I call them dress khakis, and what they did was they made your uh, your retired. Uh, uh, ID card there, and I still got it somewhere, and just had it replaced uh, just about a year or so ago, and my wife's as well. You know, but that was the the very last day, and I climbed in the car and you know, hightailed it back up towards uh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> okay, so we're just about getting to the uh, conclusion of the interview, so. The next question is going to be the final closing questions. So, the first one is a. Uh, you said this is your first time back on the ship, right? Yeah. How does it feel to be back home here? Oh, it's terrific. I was able to. Uh, I've shown around, 
and uh, <clears throat> when I first got here, uh, and they showed me the, the signature wall, and uh, I found a place long enough for my name and what I was on here and how long, and uh, started looking around at all the others. Well, today when I gave my presentation, I actually gave mine and the one that was written by the, the guy who had been the R Division officer, Mike Holmes. And I looked around and I saw this, this blue uh, scribble, but underneath it, it said R Division or Repair Division, uh, 1980 to 84. It had to have been the same guy, so we're right across from each other. <laughs> uh, I also uh, was shown uh, on the way back aft, uh, one of the crew here said, uh, you want to see where you used to live? He said, yeah, I really would. And he said, well, where was it? I said, Portside, uh, I think it was 01, and it's just after the wardroom. I said, oh, I know where that is. So we, we go back, we go through a watertight door, and uh, sure enough, there's that ladder I remember in this passageway that would lead to uh, uh, the wardroom. And we go up that, and uh, the... Uh, uh, the the head and showers and stuff were to your left as you come off of that ladder and then we went back uh, and there was a first door and there was another guy that I tried to get to come here named Tom Williams and he had been the boilers officer when I was M division and uh, the first stateroom was his and the thing I remember about his stateroom is uh, uh, there was always some some version of Hank Williams' uh, country western music being played by him. And then the next stateroom was mine. So we opened the door, put the light on, and it really hadn't changed much. About the only thing I noticed that was different was the mattresses. When I was on here, the mattresses were standard Navy ticking, you know, those white and gray things. And you had to, you know, put your own sheet on and make hospital corners and all that kind of stuff. But uh, if nowadays they're, you know, more like regular box bricks. That uh, the the sink hadn't changed. The safe, the same place, and the port light was was still there. Uh, we used to love, you know, when you know, when I was in there by myself, and then later when I got a roommate, it was great to have that port light because you could see as we were coming into port or going by something, you know, real easy. Yeah. And notice I call it a port light. If it opens, then what is left is a port hole. But the fixture itself is a port light because oh. it lets light in. Oh, yes. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, the final questions are, is there anything that uh, I didn't ask that you'd like to add? I can't think. I, you've been really incredibly thorough. <laughs> uh, okay. And the final question is uh, for uh, future generations uh, and, and legacy. So as you're probably aware, uh, these interviews are going to be submitted to institutions like the State Library, Library of Congress, and maybe another institution may pick it up uh, for archival purposes. So students, researchers, writers, Reporters and historians will be uh, looking at these way down the future, who knows how long. Uh, so is there anything you'd like to add as a way to leave a message to whoever may be viewing this? Well, for uh, younger people, you know, people just you know, coming out of high school or college, uh, I did, I'd like to reiterate something that one of my captains told me. And he said, if you want to be uh, successful, all you have to do is show to your superior uh, uh, it's a uh, loyalty, attention to detail, and a sense of urgency. If you exhibit those qualities, you can't help but be a, a success. Um, and it works no matter w you know, what your job is, whether you're a, a teacher, a janitor, anything, it's, uh, or a salesman, it, the same things hold true. You know, 
show loyalty to that person, to the company, to the ship, okay? uh, attention to detail, you know, did the job right the first time, and then uh, 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 a sense of urgency. Once you get done with one job, find out what else needs to be done. And the impression that you create is going to be lasting. Yes, so. Absolutely, sir. Okay, well, in that case, we can uh, conclude our interview. Uh, so, Mr. Um, Michael Shepard, uh, I want to thank you for coming on board, and uh, thank you for your service as well, uh, the Navy and uh, this nation. And I'd also like to note uh, to the viewers that today is uh, Tuesday, October 23rd of 2018, and it is the 35th anniversary of the uh, terrorist attack on the barracks at Beirut, which uh, unfortunately 299 American and uh, French service members uh, passed away. So today we had a ceremony to uh, uh, mark that uh, event and pay tribute to uh, those who passed away that day. Okay, and this concludes our interview. Once again, my name is Hugh Sung, assistant with the uh, Oral History Program at the Battleship New Jersey. And our interview guest was uh, Michael Shepard. This recording and any transcripts, abstracts, or indexes made from the recordings will be stored in the Oral History Department of the Battleship New Jersey, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, as well as the New Jersey State Library. And all recordings will be made available to writers, researchers, historians, and teachers. And my name is Hugh Sung, signing off. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome.